So my dad's really pumped about this, that he's about to preach. So you better get something to take notes out with. You better be ready to receive something good. Have you enjoyed the series so far? So good. All right. He's going to take a little bit of extra time, maybe too, but I'm ready for it. I want it. Love you, Dad. Love you too, son. <laughs> okay, I'm going to fly right into this because we got a lot to cover. So we're going to buckle up and let's go. We're in week three of our series, I Needed That. And each week we are picking a character or an event highlighted in the Christmas story, a character or event that highlights a characteristic or truth about the world-changing birth of Jesus. The desire is to create an Advent season where together we get to contemplate all that Jesus truly is and how he intersects our lives today, every day. Heather highlighted the shepherds that received the announcement of the birth and Jesus and then led us through the gratitude of how we need to be grateful for Jesus as our shepherd. Karis then highlighted Zechariah, the high priest, and then led us into gratitude for Jesus as our high priest. This week, I want to look at the genealogy of Jesus. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. And as you're turning there, just to give you a little context, you know, Luke gives us the Christmas story that we all love to read. Luke gives us all the fun stuff. Matthew takes an entirely different approach. While Luke talks about shepherds and the angels and the baby and the glorious events of Jesus' birth and conception, conception and birth, Matthew begins his Christmas story with the genealogy of Jesus. Boring. <laughs> Humble choice by Matthew, if you ask me. How can genealogy compete with shepherds hearing voices? Yeah with kings following stars, with sheep and donkeys in a manger scene? How can you make a Christmas skit using all the children of the church using the genealogy of Jesus? In choosing to highlight the genealogy of Jesus, I believe Matthew assured that his gospel account of Jesus' birth would forevermore be skimmed over for every Christmas from that day forward. But today, for today, we are going to look at Matthew's account and focus on his account. In Matthew chapter 1, we read, To Abraham was born Isaac, Jacob, and to Jacob, Judah, and to all his brothers, and to Judah, and two, and two, and two, and two, through 14 generations, all the way to King David. And that's when the people of, are exiled. And then we read, to David is born Solomon, and Solomon Rehoboam, and two, and two, and two, and two, 14 more generations, until we finally see the point of why I think Matthew started his gospel with the genealogy. In chapter 1, verse 16, finally leads to this, where Matthew writes, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. And in this sentence... We see why, Jesus, why Matthew started his gospel with the genealogy. In this sentence, Matthew gives us a critical part of the story of God, a critical part of the story of God's people, a critical part of our story. You see, the scriptures spoke of a time that God would redeem his people and call them out of bondage and into life. The scriptures spoke and the prophets told of a time of rescue, of forgiveness, of blessing that only God could bring. Only God could have accomplished, but to do it, God would have to become a man. And Matthew, in his gospel, runs through this list of genealogy to announce that time, it's come. The time that all has been spoken through the scriptures, it has come. And God will accomplish what only God could accomplish, and he has done it in the person of Jesus. Matthew in his gospel runs through the list of gene genealogy to announce that the come the Messiah has indeed come, and he has come as a man. Thank you, Matthew, for taking one for the team. <laughs> one for the team for taking ba a back seat for the rest of the time of Christmases forevermore to tell us that Messiah would do what only God could do, and to do it, he would become a man. Thanks, Matthew. I needed that. Today we're going to look at the fulfillment of the scriptures promising Messiah and how God, as the man Jesus, fulfilled every one of his promises. Messiah in Old Testament, it means the term was attached to touch lightly or rub with oil. 
That's why it became to be used as Jesus, as the anointed one. The New Testament translation of Messiah is the Christ. It's basically the same word, just translated into two different languages, and it simply means the anointed one of God. The goal today is to blow up our understanding of this Messiah. And I don't mean by blowing up, exploding it and destroying it. I mean blowing it up in the way of expansion. In truth, I think that we, the Christians of our time, in many ways have reduced Messiah to mean only our personal Savior. That Jesus came with my face in mind and with the goal of seeing Steve reach heaven. In this way, our understanding of Messiah has been reduced, and in many ways, the gospel, the good news of Messiah, also has been reduced. I was sharing the gospel with a good friend of mine and talking through the whole entirety of the truths of Jesus, and he said, I've never heard all of that about Jesus before. Every other Christian has, seems to follow Jesus just so they won't go to hell. That wasn't cynical. It wasn't, that's just his view. That was what he heard, just personal Savior. This is indeed a reason that Messiah came. But it is not nearly all the reason that Messiah came. Not nearly all that Messiah accomplished. So my goal today is not, if this is personal salvation, inside of Messiah is blowing up both. Not destroying this, but in both become bigger that we will see, we get to hold on to Jesus as our personal savior, but as we expand our understanding of Messiah, the fact that that Messiah is our personal savior is even more powerful. I thought it would be fun to do this by seeing how our story, what we're gonna do here today, actually intersects with an actual account and a story that happened back in Jesus' time. We're going to turn to a familiar story in Luke 24, 13 through 35. It's the story of two of Jesus' disciples on the road to Emmaus. And for the sake of time, we're not going to read through all of it, but it's a pretty familiar story. Two of Jesus' disciples had stayed with him to the very end, through it all, through the crucifixion. But now they had left confused and dejected. They had left Jerusalem and were journeying away from Jerusalem. It was over. The Messiah, the one they had put their hope in, that they had put every trust in, had just died a humiliating, dehumanizing death in, by crucifixion. Jesus himself joins them, but they don't know that it's Jesus. But in their confused state, they're happy to process what has happened with anybody. And so Jesus says to them, what are you two talking about? Are you kidding me, they say? Are you the only one in the world who hasn't heard what just happened in Jerusalem? We thought, we hoped, we saw. He did all these amazing things. We thought he was the one, but now he's been killed. And, and now there's no body. We don't know what to do with this. And Jesus responds to them, oh, you who are so slow to believe and understand, everything was just as God said it should be. Let me show you. We cannot know exactly what Jesus told them, but we know it was the truth of the Messiah and all the scriptures because of verse 27. It says that Jesus said, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So today, I want to take our walk to Emmaus with Jesus, with the scriptures, all the prophets and Moses. That's a big chunk. That's a big chunk. I'm going to take a shot at what was likely talked about between Jesus and those two disciples just days after his crucifixion. We are going to look at Messiah through four major themes that are talked about all through the scriptures and all the promises by God for the people of God. Four major themes permeate the scriptures from beginning to the end. One is that the end of exile would be accomplished for the people of God. Second, that forgiveness of the people's sins of, of the people of God. Forgiveness of the sins of the people of God. Third, the final establishment of the temple of God. And fourth, the arrival of the kingdom of God. Sound heavy? It's not. It's going to be fun. 
I want to tell you, I learned so much in this message, and I am convinced if you'll stick with me on this, there is something new for you today in understanding of the power and promise of our Messiah. So stick with me and ask God, what is new for me today? Okay? So I want to tell you, I'm going to continue. Here we go. Borrowing heavily from one of my favorite scholars, N.T. Wright. The history of the people of God was one of blessing, sin, warning from God, more sin, exile, God's mercy, and then a return from exile. It's a history of that. Exiles were always God's judgment for the people's repeated sin. There were three huge periods of exile in the history of the people of God. The first one we're very familiar with was in Egypt. They were in exile in Egypt under the oppression of the Egyptians, and they needed rescue. And so God sends Moses to bring the people out of the exile, initiating the Passover celebration. And we get the great event that we know as the Exodus. The people of God from that point on prosper as they move into the promised land. And then they forge all the way in and do really well all the way up until the reign and rule of King David. But then things start to fall apart again. The people of God split into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. And after that, they follow a series of mostly bad kings, wandering. And eventually both kingdoms are carried off into different lands from different conquering nations. And the people of God are now forced to live under the rules, the culture, the values, and even the religion and the gods of their conquering nations. The sad truth is that it's at this point in history that the people of God pretty much cease to exist. They are now under the bondage and domination of a godless people. Eventually, not all, but some of the Israelites return from the exile geographically. In other words, they return to the people or the, to the place of their calling, Jerusalem. But they did not return in the image bearers of God. They did not return to their personal calling and their vocation as the people of God. Although they had returned geographically, they never picked up their calling again to make God known to the world. At the time of Jesus' birth, the people of God are again in exile. Even though they are geographically now in Jerusalem, they're in the place where they are to live, but they are not living out their vocation as the people of God, sent out to be light to the world. They're under the rule and reign of Rome, as Heather showed us. Once again, they're oppressed and they are persecuted. The teachers and the prophets, all the scriptures spoke of a Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, who would return to the people, who turn the people of God to the glory of God. The people awaited this anointed one for them to deliver them back to the glory of being the people of God. Messiah, the anointed one, when he came, would end the judgments of God and the exile of God forever. First big theme. Second big theme. But it was fully understood for the exile of the people to end forever that the sins of the people had to be paid for. Which brings us to the second great theme. All through the scriptures, from Moses through the prophets, the complete and final forgiveness of the people of God is promised through Messiah. For the exile to end, the final exodus to happen, the people of God had to return to living being the people of God, had to have the forgiveness of sins. And I need to draw a distinction, again, a, a distinction here that offers, I think, something different than the way we normally think. We often think of, our, of forgiveness of sins in terms of just our individual sin. But for the Jews, for the people of God waiting for Messiah, they would have acknowledged that they were personally sinners, but they also thought more corporately. They also knew that when Messiah came, he would forgive the sins of Israel, all the sins of the people of God, for the purpose of restoring the people of God. I think we tend to focus on what N.T. Wright labels as our small s sins. Our personal behavior, personal mistakes, and personal moral failures. Yes, the Israelites were guilty of lying, cheating, adultery, not loving others as they should, but even worse than that, they were, bigger, they were guilty of an even bigger S sin, the sin of idol worship. Israel, the people of God, knew that they as the people of God were guilty of idolatry and that Messiah would have to rescue from that sin. This did not come in just the form, their idolatry did not just come in the form of worshiping golden calves 
or they came in the same way that we see idolatry creep into our society today. It came in the worship of other humans, other leaders, other cultures, money, family, and even religion. Yes, they were guilty of moral failure, but much more than that, they were guilty of failing to worship God, which was their salvation. The worship of God is our salvation. That was the big loss. Every little less sin has a trail back to a big S sin. If I lie in business in order to make a deal go my way, the lie is the little s sin. But it has its trail back to a big S sin. Why did I lie? In order to uh, manipulate the outcome of that deal so that I would get more money, so that I could get more comfort for myself, or more pleasure, or more space, or more safety, the difference, the big S sin, is that I worshipped me in that deal. And I chose my worship of the big S sin, and that causes the little S sin. And it was the big S sin that the people of the time knew had to be forgiven for them to be restored. For this to be accomplished, it was all through the scriptures and the prophets that there was a cup that must be emptied. It had to be emptied by a man, and it was a cup only Messiah could drink. And it was called the cup of the wrath of God. Jeremiah 25, 15 says this, For this, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. One person, one man, Messiah, the anointed one, comes and takes all the sins of Israel's idolatry, all the sins of idolatry on himself once and for all. And that's why Isaiah talks about surely our griefs he himself bore. And our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves are esteemed in him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by this scourging, we are healed. The scriptures, Moses and the prophets, knew that only Messiah, Messiah had enough love in him to drink that cup and to endure the wrath that was coming without turning away, without sinning. This leads us to our third great theme, the temple. Another role of Messiah also was shadowed through the scriptures and Moses through the prophets. Another thing Jesus likely walked through with our friends on the road to Emmaus was the establishment of the temple of God. See, all through the history of the people of God, the promise of the presence of God was always made from start to finish. I will dwell with you. I, you will have my presence. Exodus 25, 22. There I will meet you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in the commandments of the sons of Israel. And out of the Exodus, through the journey of the promised land, the presence of God dwelt in a temporary portable tent called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was literally called the place of meeting with God. It was the promise of God's presence for God's people. Then after settling in the promised land, Solomon built the permanent structure, the temple of God. But again, N.T. Wright writes this. The tabernacle and then the temple in Jerusalem were the dwelling place not for humans, but for the presence of God. These were to be microcosmoses of creation itself. A place where when the people entered the tabernacle or the temple, God and man would meet. God himself was present, and humans bearing his divine image played their priestly role. Heaven and earth were brought together. That's the picture of tabernacle, temple, and the fulfillment of temple. David had asked God if he could build the temple, but God said, no, your son will build the temple. I think it's really interesting. There's some cool scripture that actually highlights the fact that maybe God said no to David because for David, another son would build his permanent temple. And that's why the genealogy of the permanent temple goes through David. It's kind of cool. When the Israelites returned from their exile, they did indeed rebuild the temple. But here's the important part. They pretty much acknowledged that even though they had rebuilt the structure of the temple, God's glory had not come back into the temple. It was rebuilt as a symbol that one day the glory would return, but it was acknowledged by the prophets that not yet. But God had not, no longer dwelt in the temple. It was a symbol of what was to come. Isaiah spoke of the glory of God someday returning in plain sight. 
Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, all insisted that the glory of God would return, but it had not happened yet. It was this second temple, the empty temple, that existed when Jesus came. Finally, the fourth of our big topics, the kingdom. When Jesus walked our friends to the road of Isaiah, all the scripture and the prophets and Messiah, I believe he must have reminded them that the coming of Messiah meant the arrival of the kingdom. If you had talked to our two friends on the road, if any had uh, talked to the Israelites, any Jew, or any of the people of God, and asked them, what will Messiah bring? They will say, he will bring the kingdom of God. And when they were speaking of the kingdom of God, they were not speaking of heaven. To the people of that time, the arrival of kingdom meant this, the return of the rule and the reign of God on the earth. If you would have asked them what kingdom of God meant, they would have said that will be the time that the rule and the reign of God begins to return to the earth. They believed God was going to bring justice, mercy, peace to the earth. The only question was how, when, and through whom. There were three strategies that existed at the time, three strategies that were all being tried by people, separatist strategy. We're just going to try and live separately. We're going to devoid ourselves from all culture and all society and hope that God comes up and shows something somehow. We're going to have the assimilation strategy that says we're going to get as long as well as we can with the existing culture, come as close to them as possible, and hope that somehow God will confirm it. And the third strategy was the zealot and violent strategy. We will bring the kingdom by violent act and active rebellion. All three strategies had been tried all throughout history, and they were being tried at the time. False messiahs had risen up before Jesus and after Jesus that said, follow me in violent revolt, revolt, and we'll turn over the people and we'll take the kingdom by violence. All of them failed. All of them before Jesus, all of them after failed and ended up with the people going under more persecution and the messiahs themselves being executed. And the people waited for the kingdom of God to come to earth. They knew it would come through Messiah, but they did not how, know how, when, and they did not know who, and they did not know how. That's the world as it existed when Matthew writes this statement. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. And Jesus' life from that point forward goes on to intersect and change every theme that existed all through the scriptures and to make every promise of God come true in his life. For the exile, the judgment of Jesus proclaimed freedom. He said, it is finished. You are free. After defeating Satan in the desert, he comes back and steps into the public eye and proclaims, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus, Messiah, brought complete freedom for the people of God then and for the people of God now, for you today. Freedom from everything. Freedom from political division because our ruler is not of this world. Freedom for how others look at us because we are children of God. Freedom from every sadness, every fear, every anxiety that binds us because he will wipe away every tear. Freedom from loneliness because this Messiah is also our friend. Freedom from the fear of death because when we die, we live and we will live forever. God, through Paul, sums it up in this way. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And you're free. Never to be in exile again. That's what Jesus fulfilled. Thank you, Messiah. Thank you, Jesus. I needed that. As for forgiveness, remember the scriptures said, Messiah, a Messiah, a man would drink the cup, the awful cup of God's wrath. Messiah, Jesus drank that cup. And don't think for a second that it was easy. Sometimes I think that we let the knowledge that Jesus was also God think that somehow his suffering was minimized. It wasn't. We somehow let ourselves think that the taunting did not hurt his spirit like it would hurt our spirit. It did not feel a humiliation of being spit on 
like we would feel if we were spit on. Like he would not have felt the sorrow of abandonment like I do. He did not feel the nails pierce and crush his bones and flesh like we would. But it's not true. He did. He felt it all as a man. And he still took it. Mark 14, 36. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup. What cup? cup of the wrath of God. Please remove this cup. But your will, not my will. Drinking the cup of God's wrath was the hardest, most painful, sacrificial thing any man will ever go through. And he was a man when he went through it. On the cross, Jesus outstretched his arms holding on one side the pain of the world and on the other side the love of God. And he held on until they collided. Yes, by this one great sacrifice, your personal sins of lies, cheating, temper, not loving others are forgiven, but those are a little less sins. Messiah had a bigger redemption for you from a far more dangerous and far more destructive, far more powerful, big S sins. Messiah went and did battle against every idol we will come up against. And he embarrassed them and destroyed them and revealed them for who they are. Liars, things that cannot deliver and cannot stand. That was the battle he took on for us. And he did it because he knew they would steal worse than our moral failures. They would steal the greatest gift we ever have had. And that is they would steal the worship of God from us. And he said, not going to happen. We have to envision that on the cross, Jesus saw us like we were going over the edge of a cliff toward of idolatry. And on the cross, he reached down and grabbed us back and put us back up, dusted us off, sealed us for eternity, and said, now go and live for how you were created as image bearers of the living God. That's what Messiah did on the cross. That is forgiveness at the cross. That we were redeemed not just from our moral failures, but we were redeemed for our vocation to be the people of God. The people of God were back. The image bearers of God to the world now existed again. This is our calling. This is our glory. Thank you, Messiah. Thank you, Jesus. I needed that. As for the redemption of the tabernacle, the temple of God, Messiah, Jesus did that too. With Messiah, the glory of God returned to earth, John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt, literally tabernacled or pitched his tent among us. But not only did it return in Messiah, not only did it live, dwell in Jesus, the presence of God stayed and stays today. Because from now on, we are the temple of God and the glory of God dwells in us, never to be separated or taken from us again. John 14, 17, that is the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. If God is everything he claims to be, then can I ask you what would wreck your day? If God is everything that he has claimed to be in the scriptures, what is going to cause you to be afraid? If God is everything he's ever promised you to be, what is going to make you anxious? I would contend nothing. What we need most is the assurance from God that he is everything he has said he is and promised he is. That's where real peace comes from. And when the Messiah came, he said, I will put that peace inside of you and you will never be separated from it again. Thank you, Messiah. Thank you, Jesus. I needed that. As for the kingdom, Messiah, Jesus confirmed that everyone had waited for, that the kingdom had indeed come. Matthew 10, 7, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
but it had not come and would not expand by any of the existing strategies, not by separation, not by assimilation, nor by violent rebellion to take the kingdom. Jesus did not fit into any one of these strategies. Jesus showed the people of God a new way of being the people of God, a way that they had never imagined he would show them, but he did it. When he said, repent and believe, this has often come to mean for us, repent of our little sins, our moral failures, and believe that we are going to heaven. This is true. But it's bigger than that. When Jesus said, repent and believe, I believe in all my heart, he was saying that you need to turn from your agenda and pick up my agenda. Repent just means to turn around. You need to look and stop being God, people of God your way and be the people of God my way. And believe, believe in what? Believe in my way more than your way. Repent, turn, and believe and take up my way. Jesus was saying to turn from your agenda and take up my agenda. N.T. Wright again writes, Jesus was offering us a counter agenda, an utterly risky way of being the people of God, the way of turning the other cheek and of, of going the second mile, the way of losing your life to gain it. The way, this was the kingdom invitation he was issuing. This was the play for which Jesus was holding auditions. When Jesus gave the Beatitudes, poor spirit, those who mourn, the gentle, he was not giving us a moral or ethical standard. He was giving us an entirely new way of being human beings, an entirely new way of being the people of God. And then he lived it out for us. He then did it for all to see as a man. Watch how I live it and watch how I die. He would not resist when people slapped him. He would not defend himself as they mocked him. He would not respond when people spit on him. He would not cry out as people tortured him. And as a result, even one of the people that killed him would turn and say, truly, this was the son of God. That's how the kingdom would come. And Jesus was describing his vocation, and then he lived it, and he's describing our vocation and how we are to live. It's not easy, but it's the truth. The Beatitudes were given and often are recited as a way to live for personal living so that somebody may be blessed. That is true, again, but there is a greater purpose. That is a way that we must live not just to be blessed, but to be a blessing. That is the way that we will bring the kingdom of God to earth. Why did he do it? For the joy set before him. What joy? I think what he announced the first time after he came out of the desert, the joy of preaching the gospel, the joy of setting people free, the joy of bringing healing, the joy of announcing the day of the Lord and the freedom from oppression. We, the redeemed people of God, have the same calling, and it will be the same joy to preach the gospel, to bring healing, to set people free. That is our joy like it was his. And the great news is, it won't be a burden to us. We will gain life as we give our lives. We are not rescued from creation. We are rescued for creation and redemption. Thank you, Jesus. I needed that. So what about our two friends on the road? How did they respond to all of this revelation that Jesus gave them about Messiah and the fullness of Messiah? Well, it says in verse 32, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us, explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They had been leaving Jerusalem, confused, dejected, and lost. Then they heard the truth of all Messiah confirmed in Jesus. And what did they do? They turned and ran back to Jerusalem because they had a glorious calling to live out. And so do we. We must run back to our calling, a glorious calling. Thank you, Messiah. Thank you, Jesus. I needed that.
That's what you call a mic drop, I guess, right there. <laughs> All right, that's a good word. Let's respond to that together. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? <laughs> hey, when you're a legend, you can do legend things, right? So, uh, no, we... <laughs> go ahead and stand up. We're going to respond to this like we do every week. And uh, we're going to sing one more song together. And I want to encourage us to just listen to whatever God has been stirring inside of you. I love this whole point that Christmas isn't just a celebration that God came. Like my dad said so many times in this message, he came exactly how we needed him to. And he came and he changed not just, like he didn't just come, he changed who we are. Amen. And there's a story in Acts chapter. <coughs> Pretty emotional. <coughs> I'm so good right now. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up after the Holy Spirit comes and he preaches a message really similar to what my dad just preached. He walks the people of God through their whole history. And it says that people were cut to the heart and they just said, what do we do now? And he said exactly what my dad said this morning. He said, repent. Repent, turn to Jesus, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they can go and do everything God is calling you to do. And I believe too many times we're waiting on God to do one more thing in our life so that we can do the things that he's called us to do. We're waiting and saying like, well, God, if you just give me this or if this would happen or if that would happen. And he's like, no, 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 just turn. Turn from everything that's holding you back. If you'll let me fill you, you will step into everything that I've called you to do. I believe Christmas is a celebration that we're called. Christmas is a celebration that we are empowered. Christmas is a celebration that the Messiah has come and he has set us free from everything. So that where his very spirit is, there is freedom. There's no list, it's just freedom, everything, all of it. And I wanna encourage you that you're free this morning. And so as we worship right now, I want to encourage you to repent. <laughs> I want you to encourage, I wanna encourage you just like all through the scriptures to say, Holy Spirit, would you come? And would you show me any way that I'm holding myself back because of my belief? You're not doing it, God, help me. Where am I committing the, the little sins or the big, the big sins? Where, where am I? worshiping myself or am I worshiping something else how can I turn towards you right now and be set free repentance can get a bad rep but it's freedom it's freedom and we're going to have a handful of people off to the sides like we usually do if you need somebody to pray with you please don't leave without having somebody pray with you there's no sense leaving you're in church so you can have somebody pray with you or you can just be where you are as we sing just turn your heart towards God and say Lord would you turn me from any worship of something else, of somebody else, of myself, would you reveal yourself to me so that I might see you and worship you and be set free. So Lord, we love you so much. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, would you come in this room? Would you be with us even in this moment? Would you convict us, Lord, of anything that is holding us back from you? And would you teach us to worship again? Would you show us you, yourself, as Messiah who sets us free? And as we see you, Lord, would you empower us and send us out into this glorious calling that we share with you. In Jesus' name, amen.